Welcome to this episode of the Formula Podcast. I am your friendly neighborhood host, Trevor Carlson, and today I have with me Alejandro Loaza uh, Grisi. Hopefully I didn't butcher your name too much. Uh, he is the filmmaker behind probably one of the most beautiful films I've ever seen, uh, Utama, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly as well. It's a uh, it's a beautiful story uh, about this couple living up in the mountains and the struggles they go through with climate change. I feel like maybe getting older, adapting to different times. And uh, I won't ruin it for, for you guys, but it's it's a fantastic film. I was really excited to, to have you on today, Alejandro. And I'm excited to talk about filmmaking because I am, I'm working on getting into it. But I will admit, like, when it comes to your level of cinematography and mine, I feel like I feel like a, a baby, a, be, a level one <laughs> versus like what you were able to do in this movie. So thanks for coming on the show. And yeah, tell me a little bit about what got you into filmmaking in the first place. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me, Trevor. And pronunciation was OK, so <laughs> no worries. OK, thanks for your words on, on the demo. Um, I first started my career as a still photographer, and I still I, I still do photography. I love photography, and um, my father is also a filmmaker. So my first gigs were working with him as a still photographer on set you know, on his films, and I I just loved it. And um, I started then to I grabbed the video camera, so I started to learn about cinematography i started to learn about the set the lighting and and then i moved to writing and direct so it was very natural and there was no specific moment i would say it was uh, first photography then cinematography and then direct yeah i i read something that said like i feel like you did another interview where they were talking about how different the film looked in comparison to a lot of other films and they said that potentially it was your background in still photography that gave you that that different perspective when you're looking at a frame yes it, it, that might be one of the reasons because for a long period of time i was decided to be a cinematographer and i used to watch films thinking about that and only about that not not the narrative not the the acting, but the light and the framing, and and I think that gave me a, a very strong background to when I built uh, Utama, and um, I was very lucky to work with Barbara Alvarez. She's one of the best cinematographers in, in Latin America. She's from Uruguay, and and she worked, for instance, with Lucrecia Martel in The Headless Woman, and we both had the same film in our minds. Uh, in our head, in our imagination. So it was easy when we arrived to the set. Uh, it was easy to, yeah, to to just apply what what we planned for a long time. And I really had a very clear idea of how I wanted the film to look like uh, because I traveled a lot of times to the to the mountains, to the Bolivian highlands, and and always with a camera. So I also had a lot of a lot a lot of of references and that reminds me like the two the two main maybe i shouldn't jump to this just yet but the two main act like the act, main actor and actress they had never acted before they were just people from the highlands right yes they are people which is crazy to me crazy but they did an amazing work and, and yeah yeah we rehearsed a lot and we worked also with a with a coaching with a coach and yes it was like six weeks rehearsal and and they learned to act and they became professionals they were not professionals but after the film i have no doubt they are a professional act yeah that was when i was doing research for the interview i stumbled on that and i was like how like, they did such a good job like there's there's so much you know there's so much brooding and like this underlying drama and tension and for that for you to get that out of people who had never acted before i just thought was very i was just shocked i, I was like there how is that possible that's crazy it worked out i think because they're probably people that do live in the highlands right yes they do live in the highlands and they live in a very small town not the same as in utama because in utama they live uh, alone in, in a small house there is still people that lives that way but the actors they live in a small town but a very small like around 30 families mm -hmm. yeah so it's probably a bit of a, a life like a it was probably a big change for them to go from I'm, I'm guessing they were farming or something there to now now being professional actor and actress it, and it's, it's a big change when you're in your almost 80s 
because maybe when you're younger it's easy to learn something new but when you're 80 i don't know if it's so easy and they did they learned and they did an amazing work and yeah how did you talk him into it um he was very excited from the first moment but she was not <laughs> and she she made the decisions <laughs> They are a real couple, true life. So, but she was like not that interested. But then I guess they they saw that we shared the story with them, and their nephew helped us with a lot of things for the film, for the for the shooting. And I guess he also helped us convince them, um, because they saw that we were serious and it was not that it was going to be a nice thing and a fun thing to do. And and yes, they luckily they they they, they were convinced. Yeah, yeah. That's well. I think it worked out perfectly because i feel like if you would have had professional actors come into that environment it wouldn't have had the same it wouldn't have felt the same you know like it felt like you were actually in their home like you were actually following them around it was very real because I, I um if it's anything like i just spent some time in the i guess probably the equivalent of the highlands in peru mm -hmm. and i feel like people that live up there kind of have very distinct features even like i don't know like you know what i mean though like how they how they dress, how they like their facial features. Um, and you can't really, it's really hard to make that up somewhere, you know? Yes, I agree. They, of course, they could empathize a lot better with the situation, with the characters. They are different from the characters they are performing. And so that was also a difficult thing to do because they are really performing. They are really doing a, an actor job. And, um, but they could empathize with the characters and with the situation and with the love of the land. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, and, and as you say, there are small gestures and small things that, that the, an actor, I, th I think, cannot do and we don't have a big industry in Bolivia it's a very very small cinema industry so you we wouldn't be able to to find professional actors that speak both languages and live in and are that are indigenous and that are their 80s so it was not an easy casting but we knew the best option was to find real people and teach them to to perform yeah so i want to i want to go back to the like the beginning of when when you started taking still photographs and getting into videography. Do you remember the what the first picture you took was? Oh, no, I don't remember. But it was very... <laughs> I was lucky enough to learn with, with negative, with 35 millimeter, mm. because that's different. That, that's uh, a whole other story. The, the lab and, and the dark room, and yeah, it's a different story. But I, I would say it was a very... A stupid exercise not nothing very yeah. special. but i i still keep the photographies i took back there it was 2006 and i still have them and and they are black and white and mm. some of them are, are really nice yeah that's cool and i it, there's probably something about when you're in a when you're in a dark room like that and you're uh now i'm blanking on the term where you're like <laughs> what's it called when you're taking the pictures and you're developing uh, yeah developing thank you i was like pro i almost said processing i'm like that is not that's not the right term um so you're developing the pictures there's got to be almost it's probably something that makes them almost more important because it's one thing when you have an electric camera and you're just like shooting around you shoot a thousand of them and then now you know you don't have to do as much work no i know what you mean and i i would say that when you're editing a film it's a similar feeling because you have already shot everything and you know you have watched it a lot of times during shooting uh, but you don't know how it's going to end up uh, mm -hmm. turning like you don't really know and when you see it and when you see the magic of developing and and if it's a good picture then the feeling is awesome and i guess in the editing room it happens it's a similar feeling mm. it kind of it almost does it feel more do those pictures that you you took that you had to develop yourself do they feel more special to you than ones that you shoot on like a digital camera or something they feel special because they are unique once you have a, a copy that copy is a unique copy and you can do a lot of copies of course but it's not as, as easy as printing a copy and still with digital photo you don't always print your photos and now we're it's uh, even even the size is different because nowadays we're used to watch photos in a small screen and and back then with a paper it didn't matter if it was a small paper but it was still bigger than a than a screen and it's not as easy as digital because you have to have extra cares and you have to have extra processes to 
to find the, the, the right contrast and all the right colors. And if you chose a wrong film for, uh, or not a wrong film, but not the precise film for something you were, you were attempting to do, then it also looks different. So once you have the perfect film and the perfect exposure and the perfect developing process and you find the perfect contrast, then that copy is a, an extraordinary copy. It's, it's unique. Yeah, it's very special. So is there is there a picture you took that you remember that, that stands out? Yes, I have a couple of pictures that I love. I, I gave my grandmother a series of four photos and she framed them. Um. And I still look at them now, and they are good, a uh, good exercise of. And it was not something not that special. It was, um, I don't know the word in English, but when you put some some fruits and some things in this place, and you well, you take the picture. In Spanish, yeah. it's called bodegón, but I don't know in English uh, the word. <laughs> I'm not sure. Is it like you kind of set up a display of something, and then? Yeah, most most of the times they do it with fruit. It's like uh -huh. a dead nature. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. I'm just not, I don't know if there's a specific term for it. There probably is. I just don't know. <laughs> so you, you got those, you got those four photos fame, framed by your grandma and they were all, they were all just the pictures of fruit that you had set up in a way that was, was it to elicit like a certain emotion or anything like that? Or was it just like an artistic piece? Artistic piece. And it was an exercise for for yeah. classes for for the course but but then with time you know same as as films the the biggest uh, test they is time so it, a film can look great in 2000 and 2022 and then if you rewatch it 20 years later maybe it was not that great or maybe it was a film for that period of time but yeah yeah it's always funny when you watch something like for me whenever i think of anything from like the 80s or 90s when they were doing kind of the really bad special effects and they, they don't really age that well yeah. like, i think at the time when i saw them i was like whoa this is <clears throat> this is amazing this is so good and then you know after the countless movies and all the all the advancements and you see that stuff now and you're just like oh <laughs> you're like that they didn't really age very well exactly yeah <laughs> yeah so you you said you went to school for for photography i went to school to study advertisement oh and so how did that how did that lend or get into like taking pictures and video and there was a special class and, and you could take photography as a special course so that was something I learned there, yeah. Yeah, and then you decided you didn't, you didn't want to go into advertising anymore. <laughs> yeah. I worked a year in Argentina in advertising, and it was not mm -hmm. nice. And, but the things I learned there are very valuable for me now because they, they taught me psychology and human behavior and storytelling and creative exercises. So it's a, it was still a good, a good way to get into filmmaking. It seems like there's like a crossover there because you, because in that, like, if you're going to make a film or take a picture or like sell services, you have to be able to like, I, there's some level of advertising, I feel like in, in that position where if you make a film, but no one wants to watch it, then, <laughs> or no one knows about it, then that's kind of a problem. Yes, of course. Talk to me about the, like the story behind Utama. Uh, how did you come up with that? Like, what's the background? Mm -hmm. Well, before Utama, we have a family uh, company, me, my brother and my father. We are all into filmmaking and we traveled a lot around Bolivia doing documentaries. Especially there was a documentary series, television, that spoke about environmental problems in Bolivia. Uh, so we traveled from north to south and east to west. And it was pretty nice months um, that we spent traveling the country and knowing, getting to know different realities. And we don't really know what happens in the countryside. Uh, although we are very close to it, but we don't really know. And especially with environmental problems. In the cities, we are just, we have all the comforts there. So we don't ask ourselves, where is the water coming from or the garbage, where it's going to. Yeah, so, and in this in these travels, I got to know different realities and people. And I watched, we went to the highlands and we saw that they have this problem with, with water and that it was going to get worse and worse. And I also wanted, I live in La Paz, uh, which is a city very close to the to the highlands. It's a uh, 
at 3,600 meters above sea level. And, and so the indigenous cultures are very close to the city because we are neighbors, we live very close, close by. So um, I also wanted always to explore that cultures. And I also wanted to tell a love story. Uh, so it all came together, ended up as Yeah, well. yeah. It's, it's interesting, the point about like, when you're living in the city, you don't actually know. They're kind of the last to find out about the like the impact. Like, I think some people don't realize like your food has to come from somewhere and your waste has to go somewhere and it doesn't just like magically disappear. Like it's it could be affecting somebody else's life. Just like the types of food you buy, where you get it from, how you get it. And I think we're probably seeing a lot of a lot just with a lot more people in the world, you're probably seeing that on a on a lot higher scale. Yeah, exactly. So you you worked with can you remind me of the woman's name that you said you worked with on the film? Barbara Alvarez. Okay. And you said she was the best, she's the best cinematographer in South America? One of the best, with no doubt. Yes. Okay. So how did you how did you convince her to work on the film with you? Uh, well, it's a co-production with Uruguay. She's from Uruguay. Uh-huh. Um, the film was uh, going to be smaller um, because we didn't have all the budget at a certain point i was going to do the cinematography myself and that would have been very difficult and i don't know if i i wouldn't have accomplished the same results of course and then we joined with uh, this uruguayan company and he suggested her and and we just approached her and she read the script and she liked it and it was pretty easy and and then the the work with her was also pretty easy going she's an amazing person yeah but it was the script that, that convinced her. Definitely the script. Yeah. So when you were <clears throat> when you were sitting down to write the script, what was your process like? Did you have like a did you go out into like a cabin in the mountains, or did you go to like your favorite cafe and <laughs> or uh, want to have your favorite drink and just go and write? Or what did that process look like? Well, it was my first time writing an entire uh, film, uh, a feature film. I wrote a couple of short films, and I worked a lot first on the structure cards with small cards and structure i had this structure very well thought and then i just uh, locked myself in my apartment and and wrote it (laughs) the first draft was like that and then uh, at a certain point i went to the mountains (laughs) i went to lake titicaca for a week to write i i think it was the fifth draft and I shared the process a lot with my brother. My brother is the main producer. Um, and we also participated in a couple of labs. So um, the script has a lot of, of, of feedback, especially from my brother. So it was a, a nice process, uh, not that long. Like, well, it's still long, two and a half years, but some scripts stay wow. longer. Yeah, and, that's crazy. But of course, not uninterrupted. It, it was two and a half years where in which we we made another film in, in the middle, um, a, f- a film for my father, and we we traveled a lot. So yeah, not a, uninterrupted, but still. Yeah, years, so. yeah. If, if someone was sitting down to write, let's say their first movie script right now, what advice would you tell them, or what process would you tell them to take? Uh, well, that's not easy, <laughs> but the <laughs> advice. I mean, I guess that people find their own method and I guess it's about finding the method and having discipline. If you have to wake up at 7 a.m. for six months and just write, it doesn't matter if one line or 10 or 10 pages, but but to have discipline. Um, And to stay true to the story they want to tell, I think that's the most. Important, especially when you're doing your first film, it's it's going to be your film, and and because then it comes, it goes bigger. If if it works, then then you have you don't uh, decide everything. So in the first one, you you really get to decide a lot of things. So yeah, stay true to themselves. Yeah. What do you think the biggest difference is between? Because you said you said you'd been a part of some flops. What do you think the difference is between like the ones that are flops and the and the ones that are highly successful? I really don't know because it's you won't know that unless you fail. <laughs> I know it, it sounds <laughs> stupid, but it's it's an easy advice, but it's true. It's uh, you will never f- know, and I guess you yeah. you can sense when you have a great film 
when you have something good in your hands, you can sense it. But I guess it's also been like working a lot and, and making it better and better and asking people that know yeah. better than you. Because in your first film, you, you can't know, you can't really know. So you ask people that knows better and then you you will realize if it's working. Yeah. So it seems like feedback is a big part of the process to kind of, well, feedback and experience where the experience that, comes with working on a lot of films where you're like you can look at something and be like oh this is this is really good and then also people telling you like where what parts might need fixed and changed along the way so that way that way you're not just like in a bubble doing it yourself yeah definitely i love working with a lot of feedback and i i guess it's i think it's the best way I'm not, and sometimes it doesn't have to be an expert. You can ask your close friend that 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 has nothing to do with cinema, and you tell him or her the story, and and you will also get feedback and questions. And mm. I think that's the best way, like listening. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, especially if it's people who you think are gonna watch the film at some point or who would like pay to watch the film in the future. You want them to to like the film in some way, depending on what you want them to take out of it. So yeah, of course, to connect with the film, connect with the characters, and yeah, yeah. So I, I'm gonna ask some questions just from like a selfish front because I feel like I've done a pretty good job of you know I just did this a bunch of videos in Peru in the mountains doing the uh, Azangate trek and um, recorded a lot of like local people up there and just got a lot of interesting stuff. But I feel like I'm good at just running and getting and like shooting and stuff but then when it comes to like the planning i don't always know what looks good in the moment mm -hmm. so i'm curious if like we were going to go out and shoot something together and you noticed that like you knew that this was my weak point how would you what advice would you give me to kind of improve in those areas i would say that having a shooting list always helps like mm -hmm imagining the the sequence before you shoot it and editing in your mind while you're sh shooting and having and making sure that you have things covered like you already have what you need to tell that particular scene if you feel that you're weak in that particular area then you should uh, shoot m more and have more options so you can decide in the editing room and then you will know for the next time so yeah, i would I don't know if that helps you. I don't know if I'm answering. That. Yeah, now it's making me think that as I'm like as I'm editing now, or like as we're working on it now, I'm I'm seeing like, oh yeah, I really wish I would have had that shot. Mm -hmm. So I think next time, just like thinking about that ahead of, it's almost it probably just comes with experience too, where where you go out, you shoot a bunch of things. And then when you're editing something, you're like, man, if I just would have had like a transition shot doing that, that would have been so nice. Or if I would have taken a different angle instead of like top down or something. Yeah. So in, in the US, like American football players, they usually go watch their like game film afterwards. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, here is where I could have done better in the game. I'm not sure if in uh, in soccer in the rest of the world they do that or not, but I'm, I'm guessing like some of the high prof highly paid professionals do. But I feel like when you're a making film and you go back and you like watch all your clips and you're editing it it's almost like you're watching your own game film like oh yeah i should have slowed down there more <clears throat> i wish i had like five seconds longer of that take things like that so yeah. i made a lot of music videos before utama and with music yeah. videos i learned this from a friend um, i had the entire timeline of the of the song i knew exactly what was going to be there uh, once i edited I, I, I listened to the song one, one, uh, like over and over. I really knew what was going to be there. And with the film, I guess it's the same way. You can imagine the film before shooting it. Like you have the, the, the pace and the rhythm and you can almost imagine how it's going to look. Yeah, it's interesting because so with this particular, so I was so I was paid to go out with this travel company to go like shoot this truck with them. And then my whole idea was like, while I'm shooting stuff for them, I'm going to shoot stuff for my own videos. Like I, my own videos, like telling the stories of like people there, like the culture, things like that. Like not necessarily what people are going on, always going on a truck for, but I had kind of a rough idea of what I wanted. And then I got altitude sickness <laughs> really bad. And I was riding on like the horse ambulance. <laughs> I think in some scenarios, there are things like that. I, and the video I ended up sending the travel company, 
they actually loved it because I was like really, I was very authentic in the process. I was like, I feel like I'm dying right now. <laughs> it's just like the hardest thing I've ever done. And, uh, but then it showed that like the guide actually like helped help me get better and stuff like that. So it was like, even if things hit the fan, mm-hmm. we've got your back, you know? So, oh, so okay. even when the story doesn't turn out the way you want it to, or things don't happen according to plan, it can kind of be, maybe that's part of it too, is like being flexible as you're doing it when things come up to be like, oh, actually this is, this might be a bit, I didn't get altitude sickness on purpose, <laughs> but. Yeah, absolutely. You have to be flexible. Yeah. My next, so. My next question is that if, so you said you want to like get your shot list together and kind of have a plan. How, how detailed, and you said with the music video, you, you kind of visualize it before you go shoot it. How, how like detailed and planned out are you before you go start filming? Are you like, is it something where you have every shot down with like, even uh, like a storyboard of it put together? Or is it like, this is kind of like what I'm visualizing in my head and I'll know it when I see it. For Utama, there was a, we did a, a complete storyboard. So I really knew, and, and we had it on printed in the set. And so every everyone knew what we were going to shoot that day. So, and with very, very detailed. Uh, and, but as you said, also remaining flexible. And I did it that for Utama because it's very expensive to make a film and it's a, it's a high risk uh, company. So you can, you have to be extra careful. At least uh, that's how I feel for that. It was my first film. So I, I felt more, more secure that way, more, com- more comfortable. Um, mm-hmm. but I guess it's all, it also depends on the film on the actors you have. And since we were working with not non-professional actors, I think that that having it very well planned also helped us to achieve the better, the best result we could because they are not going to perform as good every scene and every take, every shot. So um, it was good for me to know once I had it with a specific angle and then change as soon as it was done. So I'm curious when when you were planning out the film, did you? Like when you were getting ready to shoot, were you thinking about the emotions that you wanted the viewer to feel when they were seeing each scene? Oh yes, yes, of course. I, I think that was during yeah. the writing in the writing process. Mm. And I work with cards, so I, I have a big mm. structure. And in the structure I already know what they might feel. So that comes before even shooting, even planning the film, it comes with the right process. And of course, yeah. it doesn't always work, but they work and then you have it. Yeah, yeah, that's something I'll have to try because I, I feel like that visual aspect of being, of when you see like this plot point happens and then this one and this one, you're like, mm, okay, and then you can just like shift it around pretty easily to, until it makes sense. You did that before or after writing? I did that two times, before writing and then mm-hmm. one. I was ready to to write the final draft and mm-hmm. I went back to the structure and back to to having a big board with colors and, and small tags and yeah, that was two times yeah okay yeah that makes sense because like the first time first time through is probably pretty rough and then after you do that then you're like okay let's let's clean it up a bit and make it a bit more clear yeah when so just is following up on following up on that last question somebody sits down they sit down they watch they watch the entire film beginning to end what's the what is like the feeling and what did you what did you want people to take away after they watched you tell i wanted to people to take away um, if i have to say one thing i would say the love story between this old cup and having yeah love story the this huge and love they have and and sincere and long love yeah yeah and there's that i feel like that's a main a big part of it is that plus just like the whole family dynamics in like a changing world where the issues they had with their son and then their grandson coming to stay with them which i really enjoyed the interactions with the grandson initially he's like sleeping in playing on his phone stuff like that <laughs> and, and then you see the the stark differences in their life like the the grandfather's you know he's taking llamas out for walking like all day and uh, maybe not all day but for a long time and and then it, this isn't like an old old time film that because you have a this character show up and he has a smartphone 
right? So it's, I don't know. I just, I thought that it probably speaks a lot to the generational differences too, that I feel like a lot of people can relate to as they get older. Yes, that was also something I, I was very interested in. And because it's it's also the gen- generation difference and also the difference between the city and the countryside. Mm-hmm. And, and those differences are even bigger in the country. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And things don't seem to change as quickly, even anywhere in the countryside. It's I'm I'm from a very small town of maybe like two thousand people. Okay. So whenever I go home and visit, you know, I still remember like using Apple they had like an Apple Pay thing at the gas station and I used it and they like looked at me, they're like, You can do that? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, you can. <laughs> you can use your phone to pay for things now. But <laughs> yeah. So I do I do know what you mean by things are a bit they tend to they don't catch up as quickly in the countryside, but there's also some charm to that too, because they kind of hold on to some of the I don't know how you want to call it, like the traditional ways, the older ways of doing things for longer. They kind of hold on to that culture piece for a lot longer that I feel like brings a lot of appeal. Yes, and uh, I think that we are moving faster than we can as a species. You know, we I think this technology revolution is bigger than we can deal with and we still have to figure out many things and and they are coming very very fast so yeah things change things that i feel like used to take months or not months they used to take years to change they seem like they take months now yeah and it's maybe i'm just getting old though (laughs) i don't know (laughs) i don't know things are changing too fast way too fast yeah i did you imagine uh when you were in university that you know um i'm sure i'm i'm positive somebody's asked you to shoot some tiktoks for them at this point did you think that anybody would ever be asking you to shoot that (laughs) anything like that (laughs) i still can't believe people do that as a profession (laughs) i mean there's some where i'm like oh that's really cool like there's a guy who does um he does super rare, like ancient, like books and stuff. And he'll like, he'll do the video where he like talks about the book and shows it. And I'm like, that's really cool. That's like, I feel like that's a, that's something where I feel like it's, I can understand the appeal there and like how that's probably good for society as a whole to be able to understand and get access to these materials that they never would. Yeah. But then, but then there's other stuff where I'm just like, we're doomed. We are doomed. Yeah. <laughs> there's nothing, there's nothing good coming out of this anymore. <laughs> yeah. And that's the majority of the content. The, yeah. There is amazing. There is a lot of amazing content in TikTok and Instagram, but it's a very small portion of it. Yeah. What is your opinion as a videographer on doing short form films for like for the short video media that's popular right now? Well, it's a new language or not a new language, but a new, yeah, a new language or a new. So it's people are going to do many interesting things. Uh, I feel old. <laughs> I'm, I don't know if I catch the the rhythm and, and the language, but uh, yeah, but I still feel that cinema is cinema. Yeah, there's something special about like the, the just sitting down and like watching a nice film where like there's character development, you get bought in, you yeah. you feel you can relate to the emotions, the ups and downs. And it's like, a. I don't think long form is going anywhere, mm-hmm. especially when people are marathoning like 10 seasons of <laughs> shows, you know, I think there's probably a place for both. Yeah. The only thing that I feel like is missing with the short form is like depth, mm-hmm. like the depth of the storytelling. It's usually just like little blips. Yeah. And it's very difficult to achieve depth in just in so small running time. It's almost impossible yeah so you're saying i won't see a tiktok channel with with your short form videos popping up anytime soon oh no no (laughs) No. all right so if if someone's all right so let's say you're talking to like a you know maybe it's like your 18 year old self or an 18, 18 year old kid that's like hey i have an idea for a film i have i have virtually very little experience i don't even know if i don't even i'm not that good with the camera or anything how do i go from this idea this this dream that i have to producing something as good as as your last film Utama? oh i don't know with a lot of work and a lot of yeah <laughs> i wouldn't know how to answer that uh, it's just a lot of work that you have to put into the writing process and think and rethink the film think and rethink the characters yeah 
So it sounds like you're saying like, be very patient and be prepared to work for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> it almost, I don't know, when you were saying that, it was kind of reminding me of like, like a wood carving or something like that, you know, or like mm-hmm. making a statue where like the, you know, you make like the initial cuts, which, you know, gives you like your shape, but then you just have to keep going and going and going and going until you find you round out all the edges and then you can take a step back and you see hopefully a masterpiece <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly it's a good a good example yeah yeah what's coming up next for you what other projects do you have any films you're working on at this moment in time yes i am writing a couple of different films i think they are in different stages of developing um but they are still set here in bolivia uh, but I'm moving to the other side of Bolivia because it was, mm. this was shot in the west side where we have mountains and, and highlands. And now I'm going to shoot in the lowlands where we have forest and jungle. So I'm going to that place now. That's where the Amazon is? Yeah. In Bolivia? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Once again, I, I will have to work with non-professional actors because I, ha- I have to work with young kids of around 17 or 18 years. Mm. Yeah. So it's a different, this is a whole different, different thing than where you're working with a lot of teenagers versus, can you share the concept behind the film or is that something you want to keep under wraps for now? I still want to keep it because it's not, it's not, I'm not ready to share it yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When do you typically share your idea? I'm just curious because some people I know are like, once they have an idea, they're talking about it. And other people are like, until like I've started shooting it, I'm not talking about it. Or I'm, until I'm in the, in like in the middle of making it, I just won't even bring it up. Oh, no, I, I already talk about it. But um, mm-hmm. well, yes, uh, but I still wouldn't be able to do it publicly, you know, because it's still, mm-hmm. it can still change a lot. So in a private conversation, I would gladly share it with, with you and, and, and maybe hear if you have questions, but yeah. And, and I don't have I mean, a particular moment, but I tend to share more than yeah. a bit for myself. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I get that. Because if you say it in a public forum, then you're, you're somewhat held a little bit accountable to what you say. So I get that. <laughs> that's cool. So I just have like one or two more questions and we can we can wrap it up. So one is if someone was, if someone was looking to improve their filmmaking skills and there was like one, one exercise or piece of the process, or maybe something you did that you felt helped you learn a lot. Um, what would that, what would that thing be? Um, something that helped me a lot was to watch films that I love and, and like, uh, put those films into paper and see how many shots they have and how many scenes they have, how long are those scenes. And yes, I, I guess that that helped me a lot. Watch it and rewatch it. And then you have an idea of how the film you love was built. I did that for Utama as well. Uh, I had some films in mind and uh, I watched them and rewatched them. So to have yeah, an idea of how I was going to do my own film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes that actually makes a lot of sense that you take because when you're watching other films, you some things start to stand out that you really like or really don't like. And if you want to if you want to emulate that, like I was I watched uh, Napoleon recently and I, I didn't really care for the the how they did the story that much. But I really liked the uh, however they did whoever did the color uh mm-hmm. On a lot of the scenes i really liked because it just felt like it just looked so nice i don't know exact i'll have to dig in deeper to see like how exactly like what type of lighting they used and how what kind of type of color correction they did after or in the editing process but um it was yeah it was very i just remember like looking at it multiple times being like wow that's a that's a very beautiful shot that's like very well well done oh that's also a good thing to to have a lot of references and and research how they did that uh, i used to read american cinematographer the magazine and that also helped me a lot yeah so you kind of build out your build out like a reference file i guess of like of like different shots and things that you liked and then you could em- emulate later on yeah yeah that's cool okay so last last question and then we'll we'll wrap it up any for your next movie that you're working on is there anything that 
like what did you learn from Utama that you're going to be applying to your next film that you think will help it? I won't say be better because it's just, it's a piece of art. So that'll help maybe deliver the story that you want to deliver a bit differently, more effectively, whatever, whatever term you want to use there. Well, as I said, with the writing process, you, you have to find your own method. And I, there are, a lot, there are a lot of things that I learned in Utama that work, those things work for me. So I'm going to do them again. And, and structure is something and planning is another thing I'm going to do again. Um, and some things I learned are, I don't have really one right now in mind, but maybe, yes, those, those things that you already know that works for you, do them again and keep on learning because i i read uh, recently i read uh, tarkovsky's book um sculpting in time do you know the book i think so yeah. yeah i've never read it but i'm familiar and he talks about his learning process in every film and filming i guess filmmaking is a constant learning process so yeah, yeah. uh okay i have one more question <laughs> the, uh, so uh, this is something that i so i'm I did a Kickstarter for a book uh, a few months ago, and I'm on I'm on like the fifth draft or something like. And I feel like I have very bad writer's block now. Like I'm, I feel like I'm on that last pass through where I'm fine tuning everything. But I've I found myself stuck where I've rewritten the same chapter probably eight times, and like I see the story in my head, but then when it comes to writing it down. I don't like how it's coming out on paper. So what what advice do you have to get over? I, I, I see you smiling because I'm imagining you have probably experienced some things like this before. But what do you what do you do personally to get past those moments? Do you take like a shot of what's the traditional uh, Bolivian liquor there? Is it Pisco? No, that's... No, no, that's from... We have a similar one, but it's called Singani. It's, all, it's very Singani. similar to Pisco, but... Mm. but yeah <laughs> but better yeah. okay <laughs> so do you take a shot of that or what, what's your what's your way of getting past your your writer's block or challenging moments when you're trying to work past those things i really don't have an answer for that <laughs> i'm going to run <laughs> right now and I, I force myself to write whatever it doesn't matter if it's with in the same story uh, part of the same story or a different story and I have came up with other ideas during these processes process of not knowing how to move forward uh, so it's just and I have also traveled to a different place to have uh, to change uh, the, the vibes but yeah I don't have a, a very yeah. precise answer for that yeah. well maybe you did answer it actually because I you can Correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded like you just write a bunch of, you just, even if it's bad, you just write it and you yeah. kind of get it out. And then it sounds like maybe you just have to keep writing t bad stuff until, until finally you find like you're able to get back into your flow. Yes. And you can also move to different stories so you can have perspective on that one that you're stuck with. So I think that's actually very helpful advice because <laughs> I, I think that you can get into this judgmental cycle where you're like, man, I'm writing all this and it's so bad. Like it's no one's going to read this. <laughs> no one should read this. It's so bad. Um, but I think that maybe that's all part of the process is you just have to kind of get through those bad, those bad drafts and hopefully they're not too many, but yeah, yeah but yeah. It, it's taking away the pressure because of course there is pressure and it's impossible not to have it and not to put it on yourself. You put your pressure on yourself, but, um, yeah, once, I mean, there has, there are a lot of films going, uh, make being made every year and a lot of books so it doesn't really matter yeah i know no, it's like it's like this sometimes in your mind though you think oh man this i'm gonna put this out there and it's gonna it's gonna be everyone's gonna watch it and it's either gonna be really bad or really terrible but then sometimes you realize you put stuff out and like the biggest failure is no one like yeah. just no one watches it nothing happens like yeah. that's it and really that's not that bad it's just kind of like you just move on yeah you're learning yeah of course yes <laughs> okay uh any any last words or piece of advice for we sign off all right well thank you thank, thank, thank you for you. joining us today uh, thank you